coat, Todd. Let's say just to make it nice. No, I better not do that. There's a U and a U and a D quark going along. And then, from time to time, there's a kind of photon, but it's not a real photon. It's a different thing. It's called a gluon. You can imagine <laughs> the level at which the physicists who can call that truth, they can't... Why is it called a glue? Because it's a particle like glue holding these things together, so it's a gluon. And the gluons go across and do various things in here in a complete analogy to the way the electrons have photons go between them in an atom. And the gluons then are the next particle, and why the colors are shifting here, I'm not uh, quite sure, but they are gluons. Okay, and they have a rest mass zero, like photon and a zero ch charge. But they couple strongly. I should put down here. Couples to electrons, or couples to charge. This one couples to those pairs, and this one couples to quarks. All right. The particle has the same polarization character as the photon, and so on. We just repeated. It just looks like I've just repeated. Quantum electrodynamics at a different scale with a stronger coupling. It's almost that. It's very close to that. It's almost exactly the same as electrodynamics on a different scale. I would now, yeah, I think, I don't know whether it's worth describing exactly the difference. It's rather curious and interesting. And uh, I see I have a little time, so I'm going to do that. Before I do that, I have to finish with two remarks. One. We still have to ask, how does something like this happen? And the answer is, it's the quarks which are doing it. It's the U quark, which can turn to a D quark, an electron and neutrino, so that inside here, I'm sorry, I got it backwards, D turns to a U, so that the DDU comes to the UUD. Surprising, but you only have to change one of them to do that, because they, they're moving around. So the D turns to U, so the really, this is not the fundamental rule but the fundamental, damn this, excuse me, <laughs> squish, is, <laughs> is that the D part of quark can turn into a U quark plus an electron plus a neutrino, and that that's pictured by supposing that on that line that we can have the following diagram. Let's see, I got, for some dumb reason, I've caught myself by making all the quarks blue. And so on. I, it's terrible. I don't mean anything by these colors, but just to, to remind you, it's a quark. This is a D quark turning into a U quark with the emission of a green thing, <laughs> a W meson, and then going into. <laughs> I got myself into a pickle, okay? <laughs> I should have anticipated that I'd get into this difficulty. The colors are just to keep track of the different types of particles to help you a little bit. Electron neutrinos. Did I get the sign wrong? Yes, I got the sign wrong. It's an elect neutrino electron. Oh, yes, in this diagram, it's an anti-neutrino. That just means this arrow's up there. Well, that's all right. You can, that's clever. You know how to turn that up there. And this is a quark coming in here. So we have to say, in addition, that the... Uh, W particles couple not only to these pairs, but also to other pairs. And uh, another pair, it involves the quarks. For example, here would be that it was uh, the U quark coupling to the D. All right? This is not quite right. I'll put that there to remind you. Not quite right. Uh, it turns out that the C quark couples to the S. Not quite right. And nobody knows what the heck goes on beyond. What's not quite right is, well, I have to well, say one more thing. That tells us how the Ws couple to the quarks almost. There's a slight fixing I have to do. Now, I always also say that the photons couple to the quarks. We know that because we know the proton is electrically charged. And if it's going to be made out of quarks, then the quarks have to be electrically charged. And electrical charge means that the photon couples to it. Now, the electrical charge in this case has to add up to one. The electrical charge in this case has to add up to zero. 
And the difference between these two must be one and all of that. Anyway, when you get finished, you find that the U's have to have a charge of plus two-thirds. In other words, the, the charge of these particles goes like this. Plus two-thirds for the U, and minus one-third for the D, and minus one-third for the S, and plus two-thirds for the C. And let's see, the B, the B is probably minus a third, but now we don't have too much. It's a good guess. So we haven't checked it, but the others are much better understood. And so, of course, the T is no doubt plus two-thirds. But that's waiting to be found. Now, with regard to the mass, I cannot really give an answer. There's no way to define the mass because you can't get the particle out separate. And so we have technical arguments as to different ways of defining the mass. And everybody who defines the mass differently comes to uh, different numbers here. So the numbers I'm going to write here are not accepted by everybody. And I won't accept them myself on another lecture when I redefine the way I define it. But for the main feature, I'll define it somehow. And with some particular way of defining it, this is 400 and this is 402. And this one is 500, roughly. And this one is uh, 1800 or 1900. No, 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 1600. And this is 4500. When they get heavy, everybody agrees with the definition. But when they get light, the problem is the interaction energies are so big that you can't tell how much is due to mass and how much is due to coupling, and it's hard to define it. The feature that we do know is that these two are the same. And this is more. And then when they get heavy, we got the numbers. Okay? These are lighter. So that the lightest of all of the strongly interacting particles are made of U and D quarks. Heavier ones involve sometimes an S. For many years, we thought the only kind of quarks we would have were the U, D, and S. By the way, the names of these different, when you want to say different kinds of quarks, you say different flavor of quarks. The flavors that we had for many years were just these three. And in 1974, we found a particle called the Psi meson, which could not be made out of these quarks. And there was also a very good theoretical argument that there had to be a fourth quark, having to do with that theory over there, the Weinberg and Chiron. And that's called the C quark. That one belongs with this number. And uh, that checks out. And very, very recently, within a year or so ago, we found another funny particle, which means that it has to be another quark, another flavor, all right? And so that's uh, putting down these charge numbers and telling you what pairs couple to the Ws. And my getting all these pictures tells you almost the whole theory. The only thing that's not quite right is this. It turns out that the U, which I drew here, let's say the U is connected to a D. The U can also be connected to an S. And in fact, when the U goes through like this, it turns into a D or an S, one amplitude for D, another amplitude for an S. So that what really happens here is a combination, some amplitude for D, and also some amplitude for S. And the, in here, it's a, it's a big amplitude for D and a small amplitude for S. Here it's the other way, a small amplitude for S and a, a big amplitude for S and a little amplitude for D. It is very likely that there's some amplitude for B in here also. In fact, there's pretty good evidence that there's a very small amplitude for B. So I could put that in, but it's not known very well. Why it chooses these proportions for those two amplitudes is utterly unknown. So I got everything out. It's terrible mix up. And uh, you say, oh, it's a hopeless mess physics has got itself worked into. It has always looked like this. It always looks like a horrible mess. But as we go along, we see patterns, and we push them back down so that uh, we put theories together. We combine this stuff, and pretty, the certain clarity comes, and it gets simpler. It's a lot better than the terrible mess I would have made with the 405 particles a few years ago. The, quest, the thing that I would finish with, uh, I, would, I think it's just as well that I finish the summary rather than try in more detail how these gluons work. It turns out there are eight different kinds and so on. <laughs> but I'm not going to complicate that. The thing that I would like to emphasize, though, is this. That all these theories are very similar to quantum electrodynamics. They have little tricklet changes, little small 
counting changes, but they're very similar. They all involve the interaction of a spin one half type object with a boson of spin one type object. Uh, one case is obscure because it has a mass, but as a matter of fact, all the masses are obscure. So now let me talk now about the grand problem. The character of the theory, forget about the masses for a minute, the character of the theory certainly indicates, well, looks like they're the same somehow. They're, they're very, very similar. But remember something. We have not yet checked quantitatively this theory with the gluons. It might be wrong. We have only got a few experiments to check W boson. That might be wrong. On the other hand, why does it look like it could be the same thing repeated? There's several possibilities. One, it's a limited imagination of man. When he sees a certain theory and he sees a new phenomenon, he tries to fit it with that theory. And until he's made enough experiments, he doesn't know that it doesn't work. And so when he gives a lecture in 1979 in New Zealand, he thinks it works. And he says, this is the way it works. And it's, look how wonderfully similar they are. It's not because they're similar, really. It's because all we've been able to think of is the same damn thing over and over again. <laughs> Another possibility is that, as a matter of fact, it is the same damn thing over and over again. And uh, that nature has only one way to do it, so to speak, and she keeps repeating her story from time to time. And there's a third possibility. And that is, th they look very similar because they're different aspects of the same thing, that there's some larger picture from which it's to be understood that the thing breaks down into what looks like different things, but they're different cases of the same thing, not different cases. Uh, well, it's very hard since I haven't got the right theory. I can't exactly explain myself, but I'll try the best to say that uh, there is one large object which has supposedly a first approximation, well, has a whole lot of fingers, and these are the different fingers. But they all belong on the same hand, and they all got the same characteristics. And the reason, therefore, that they repeat the pattern of having the same kind of interacting particles and the same kind of coupled particles is that they have the same, they really come from the same thing. And so there are many people, of course, working, trying to get the grand picture, which puts all this together in one super-duper model. And uh, I I promised you in these lectures not to talk about speculations, uh, but things that have a reasonable experimental check. None of the speculators agree with any of the other speculators <laughs> as to what the grand picture is. Throughout this entire story, however, there remains one unsatisfactory feature, and that is the mass numbers. There is no really satisfactory theory of the origin of these masses. We can write this stuff down and we see the pattern, but we don't know where these numbers come from. There are theories which suppose that there's still another kind of particle which generates mass. It has a different kind of polarization. You'll like that one. It has only one kind of polarization, not two like an electron or photon. It's called spin zero. There's proposals that there are spin zero particles in the world and various theories to show how they might produce numbers of masses, but not one of those theories really produces the numbers that we see in a satisfactory way. It just says maybe they will come out, maybe it'll do this, and maybe it'll do that, and the more you look at it, the less it turns out to be the case that it really does what you want it to do. So we do 